Right, this is the second video to unit 5.7 on respiration. It's following on from the previous video looking at aerobic respiration using glycogen. So it's going through all the stages here. If you've not seen that, you can go and watch it. I know I've got about three subscribers so far. Um, anyway, first of all, we're going to look at two things today, looking at energy values in different respiratory substances and we're also going to look at anaerobic respiration. Right, so first of all, let's look at the energy values in our different respiratory substances. So we've looked at carbohydrates, um, which is here in the red box. We already know about disaccharides and monosaccharides so a disaccharide for example would be glycogen and its monosaccharide would be glucose so as a fuel source we need to use monosaccharides we can't use disaccharides directly hence they have to be get broken down into their monosaccharide form so some monosaccharides are fructose and galactose and for us we can't as mammals, we can't respire fructose and galactose. We need to convert them to glucose. And to do that, we use isomerase enzymes. Okay, You don't have to really know how that happens. You just have to know it does. So fructose and galactose, they are converted to glucose. And then glucose, of course, as we know, can enter glycolysis which is mentioned in my previous video. Right, other than this, other than carbohydrates, we've got lipids here in the blue box. Lipids is something I'm going to spend a little bit longer on as we've only really covered carbohydrates and glucose in respiration. Um, lipids, as you should know from Unit 2, which I'm hoping to make some videos in the future, are triglycerides and phospholipids. Triglycerides um, can be converted to glycerol and fatty acids, which, like in carbohydrates, is their monosaccharide. Okay, We want not monosaccharide. In, gly in carbohydrates, we call it monosaccharides, but... In anything else, we'll just call it the monomer. So a monomer of lipids is the glycerol and fatty acids. They form the polymer, which is triglycerides. But that's something to look at in unit two. So now we've got glycerol and fatty acids. So let's just take glycerol on its own. We've highlighted this in black. And we can convert that straight away, don't need to know how, but into triose phosphate which you may remember featuring back here in glycolysis. His triose phosphate is converted by hexose bisphosphate. The process of making that, once again, is in the previous video. So if you don't understand that, go and have a look. So we've got our triose phosphate, and that can be converted to pyruvate, just like in glycolysis, and then it can enter the link reaction to then go into Krebs, etc. etc. Okay, but if you don't understand that, you need to get a grip of aerobic respiration with glycogen and glucose as the source of energy. Okay, so that's glycerol. Now let's have a look at fatty acids. So, fatty acids, as we know, they're a long hydrocarbon tail, they've got carbon hydrogen sticking up at the end like that because they've got so much hydrogen there's really good source of energy for oxidative phosphorylation as we know we have a chemosmotic potential in which hydrogens in the intermembrane space go through let's see if we can show it yet here that here it is oxidative phosphorylation we've got hydrogens here the more hydrogens there are the greater the chemosmotic potential and Therefore, the more ATP we can produce. 
Therefore, fats or lipids are considered the best energy source for in relation to the amount of energy within it, which is in this table below, which I'll go through after I've looked at protein. But anyway, so fatty acids have got these hydrogens. They're really helpful to us. So the energy released from an ATP to AMP, so adenine triphosphate to adenine monophosphate, one phosphate, that's releasing a lot of energy. It allows fatty acids to attach to coenzyme A. Where does that feature in the link reaction? Coenzyme A, you need to understand how that works. So you need to look back if you don't. Coenzyme A then can enter the mitochondria as we know, okay, for the beta oxidation, which produces NADH and FADH. Coenzyme A is f the coenzyme A fatty acid complex, which is created when the ATP to AMP here. ATP to AMP, that energy allows the coenzyme A fatty acid complex to form. That complex is then broken once we're entering the mitochondrial matrix. And then it breaks into the two carbon acetyl groups that we've seen at the start of the Krebs cycle. So fatty acids can, after this reaction, join to coenzyme A and then enter the Krebs cycle Krebs cycle as a two carbon acetyl group okay finally we're going to look at proteins so proteins um, can be used as a tertiary energy source however it requires the protein amino acid which is the monomer of the polymer of the polypeptide chain that be a, that'd be the polymer the monomer is the amino acid which I've drawn out here, they're deaminated in the liver, okay? So that means the amino group, which is this, highlighted in red, the nitrogen and two hydrogens, an amino group, is taken away. So when we take that away, we form a keto acid, which can enter the Krebs cycle. The keto acid can replace either oxaloacetate or pyruvate or acetyl-CoA um, within the Krebs cycle. So if we just look back at the Krebs cycle, we've got a keto acid can enter, oops, sorry, it can enter at this point here instead of acetyl-CoA. It can enter at this point here, instead of oxaloacetate, or it can enter just before where it's not shown in the star gram as pyruvate, but that would be involved in the link reaction as well, okay? There is also some keto acids that enter at this point as another 5C compound. Right, so they are your three energy sources, and this table here shows the values of each source. As we said, lipids have the highest value because they've got so many hydrogens. They've got an energy value of 39. And that is measured in kilojoules per gram. Okay. Carbohydrates have 16 and proteins have 17. You may be wondering why do we use carbohydrates then? And it the answer is because they are a much faster release of energy, while lipids and proteins release more energy, carbohydrates can release that energy so much faster, it's much easier for us to use carbohydrates. One last thing to look at in this topic before we move on to anaerobic respiration is respiratory quotients. So, and that is the volume of carbon dioxide produced per minute over the volume of oxygen consumed per minute. Okay, 
and this creates these three values. 1 for carbohydrates, that's what's in red, 0 0.7 for lipids, and 0 0.8 for protein. So what you can do is record the amount of carbon dioxide being produced during exercise and the amount of oxygen being consumed, you compare those two values and the number that comes out, so say we get 0.9 we can tell from that number, so we get 0.9 which is in between 1 and 0.8 we can say we're using about we're using a lot of carbohydrates not so much lipids but barely any proteins you're probably not using proteins at all okay if we get a value of 0 0.7 or anything less we're using lipids okay 0 0.8 while it represents proteins it is unlikely that we'll be using proteins okay Right, so that is the energy values in respiratory substances. Now let's have a look at anaerobic respiration. So first of all, anaerobic respiration means without oxygen. So let's think what would happen if we've got no oxygen. Let's see what oxygen's role is in oxidative phosphorylation. So it's the electron acceptor here, okay? Without oxygen, nothing would stop these electrons and hydrogens that have been pumped through here to create ATP accumulating within the matrix. So this area here is the matrix. If you've got no oxygen, nothing can accept these. And what's going to happen if we've got a large accumulation of hydrogen here? So if I take even more, if I take a quick sample, copy some of these in, copy and start accumulating them all around here as you can see I'm just going to drop it's going to look messy I'm going to drop some all over the place there's some hydrogens over there okay we're getting a large amount of hydrogens accumulating within the matrix here okay so we've got hydrogens accumulating here or hydrogens over here we don't want that because that's going to lower our chemiosmotic potential. Okay, so let's look back now. So we've got a low chemiosmotic potential as the matrix hydrogen concentration increases. So hydrogen does not want to move from the intermembrane space into the matrix anymore. So we can't create ATP. So oxidative phosphorylation ceases to exist. That means NADH and FADH cannot be oxidized. This means hydrogen released in the Krebs and Link reaction cannot be accepted. So the Krebs and Link reaction stop. Now we've got an issue. We can't respire because we've got no oxygen. So our solution here is fermentation. So there's two methods of fermentation, but the aim out of both of them is to allow glycolysis to continue. Just glycolysis, okay? So we produce enough NAD to allow just glycolysis to continue. We still won't have the link reaction, we still won't have the Krebs reaction. But these these two processes allow glycolysis to continue so we've got enough energy to carry on okay so first of all we'll look at ethanol so both these you notice start with pyruvate ethanol goes from converts pyruvate to ethanol which releases co2 and ethanol to ethanol but for that to happen two hydrogens combine with the ethanol and those two hy hydrogens come from reduced NAD so reduced NAD donates its two electron two hydrogens to become oxidized this causes a reduction oxidation is lost reduction is gain it's gain the hydrogen ethanol is reduced into ethanol
ethanol to ethanol. Just got to learn those two endings. Pyruvate, ethanol, ethanol. Okay, but in this, CO2 is produced. And this is not done in humans. It's seen in yeast. So we use it for fermentation in unit six. Okay, it's quite simple. What we're creating here is NAD that we can now take back to the glycolysis reaction. So we can still create some ATP. Remember, 2 ATP, a net gain of 2 ATP is made from glycolysis. So we can create energy. Then we've got lactate system, which is pyruvate converted to lactate. Really simple, just two words to remember there. You knew one of them already. The same thing that happened here occurs in the pyru lactate system. So NADH, which is reduced NAD, donates hydrogen to the pyruvate to become oxidized NAD, reducing the pyruvate to lactate. Okay? And once so lactate will then accumulate. I'm sure you know all about lactic acid. Same thing as lactate. Um, in the presence of oxygen, convert the lactate is converted to pyruvate, and it's recycled, or sorry, it can be recycled to glucose and glycogen. But this system is one fifteenth as efficient as aerobic respiration. However, you might be asking, if we're only producing 2 ATP, how are we going to survive? This process is really fast. It can only last for about 2 to 3 minutes, but it is really fast, so we produce a lot of ATP while it is not that efficient, and we'll spend a lot of time recovering. So that is anaerobic respiration and respiratory substances that is the end of unit 5.7. If you've not watched the previous video and you didn't understand stuff like coenzyme A or triose phosphate, you need to look back at the other video I've put up. Thank you.